Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the April edition of Molten Music Monthly. And welcome also to all those people listening on the new podcast version. Yeah, that seemed like a, a really good idea. I'll see if I can pull that off. And for the benefit of all those listening at home, I'd like you to know that in your honor, I'm doing this entire video naked. Well, it's April and what I should be doing is bringing you all of the exciting news from Music Messer at Frankfurt. But sadly, there really wasn't any. I mean, there really wasn't any. It's all turned into a bit of a kind of a, uh, Music Messer. It used to be the biggest thing on the European music technology calendar, but no, not really anymore. Everything has, of course, moved to Superbooth in Berlin. Which is happening the weekend after this one, depending obviously on when you're watching this. So next month for May's edition of Multi Music Monthly, I'm going to do it a little bit earlier. I'm going to do it after a week or two, perhaps you know the week following Superbooth, because there's going to be a whole stack of stuff to talk about. So let's get that in early rather than waiting till the end of the month. And then I can have perhaps a few <laughs> weeks break before I get into the June one. Can you imagine June already I'm talking about? But very sadly, because Superbooth happens to be over the May Day bank holiday, I can't go. I'm camping with the family, which of, of course, repeat after me, family is far more important than synthesizers and Superbooth. So if somebody wants to kidnap me in a field in Suffolk somewhere and drag me to Berlin, then, you know, go right ahead. Lots to get through this month. We've got mutual instruments rolling out marbles and stages. Prepare ahead to give people an entry level version of Reason, which is actually flipping awesome. The Exodus Digital Valkyrie was the one thing we did find at Music Messer. String Theory gives us a Selena strings right in your Euro rack. Steinberg hatches out some audio interfaces with Rupert Neve. There's a new main stage contender called Camelot. Roll and sneak out some new System 500 modules. Pittsburgh come up with a fabulous sequencer. Native Instruments NKS reaches version two and you can now stick effects in with your instruments in complete control. There's another ring in the fight for wearable MIDI control. IK Multimedia add another five classic synths to their huge Syntronic lineup. Behringer suggests that they are going to clone the Roland System 100M and somehow manage to make Eurorack look boring. But first comes the news that BandLab, the company that bought Cakewalk from idiot company Gibson back in February, have released Sonar Platinum for free for everyone. For you, you can go and kind of get it right now, the whole thing. Sonar Platinum used to be many hundreds of pounds worth of professional digital audio workstation software, and it's now free to you, free to me. All you have to do is sign up to bandlab.com and you download the thing and you download the thing and, and off you go. The only thing that's changed really is that they've had to pull out some of the third party content, some of the extra sort of samples and some of the instruments, bits and pieces who were owned by other people. Otherwise, the whole thing is intact. The whole lot, the whole of Sonar, the everything. <laughs> it's there, it's free. It's a stunning move. I'm not quite sure what to make of it really. I mean, all those Sonar users who are wondering what to do with themselves and where to go, well, all they needed to do was hang on a bit and suddenly everything was just gonna work itself out. All your old projects will run, all your old content will run. Anything you've got or purchased for Sonar will just <laughs> work straight in there. I mean, what do the other door makers think? I don't know. I mean, Cakewalk and Sonar have been such a big player for 30 years. It's weird. It's nuts. Uh, who knows where it's going to go? I mean, what sort of support Band Lab can offer? I don't know. That's a bit of an unknown at this time. Do we really need support? Can't we just download it and start making music and stop fussing about with everything? Maybe. I don't know, maybe because it's free, then people won't feel like there is support or at least BandLab won't feel obliged to give it. Is that how the dynamic works? 
I don't know. Anyway, they're calling it now Cakewalk by Band Lab and just hop on over to that website, download it, get making music. What's not to like about that? Following on from Platt's last month, Mutable Instruments have released two new modules. Both of these are, are more, more unique and more innovative rather than sort of rehashes of other stuff that they've discontinued. The first one is called Marbles. It's called Marbles, it's kind of, well, they call it a random sampler, which is a really peculiar name that annoys me because I get annoyed about these things. I mean, there's no reason to be. I mean, we should all just be chilled out and just kind of go with it. But the fact that it's called a random sampler immediately throws up the idea that it's a sampler, that it samples audio. It's like Morphogenie or something of that nature. And it's not. Or perhaps it's kind of a casual name. You know, it's just kind of some random sampler. No, it's not that either. The idea is that it's a massive source of randomization. So that's the random name. And it does that randomization by using the same process that you use in sample and hold. And then it samples something, takes that value, and then uses that value, and then samples something else. And that's how the randomization is generated. So random sampler, confusing, stupid name. Let's call it something else. Let's just call it marbles. You have eight knobs that affect kind of the, the chaos, and you have seven outputs and seven inputs to feed the chaos and take the chaos out and stick it through your rack in all kind of chaotic ways. There's sort of two channels of stuff going on on one side. There's a random gate generator for triggering sort of percussion sounds. On the other side, it's a random voltage generator for creating tunes or for controlling modulators. You can push it all into repeating and deviating and all sorts of really weird, lovely randomness. It's turning out to be a pretty awesome little module. The other one is called Stages. It's a segment generator. Again, the name doesn't really do anything <laughs> in the way of explaining really what it does. But I think essentially you can look at Stages as a sort of complex envelope. So you've got these six sliders on the front that can form a six stage envelope if you wish, or you can use each segment individually or combined. So you could have six one segment envelopes or three two segment envelopes and perhaps don't see them as envelopes but see them as moving and varying control voltage so you could put two together to make a bit of a ramp going on and then loop it and have that going around and that then becomes a ramped lfo so there's a lot within stages that allows you to create interesting forms of modulation envelope yes but also lfos and looping stuff and strange changes in control voltage very interesting I mean, with, with plates, marbles, and stages, you've kind of got three modules that would form a very interesting modular system all by themselves. All of the different sound sources in plats being meshed about by marbles and modulated by stages. Yeah, very nice indeed. And they've got more interesting things to come. Propeller heads have worked up an entry-level version of Reason that they are calling a Reason Intro. It's kind of less of an introduction though, and more like almost the whole thing. I mean, when you look down the comparison table, it's like everything's tick, 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 tick. Oh, there's a couple of things missing, then tick, 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 tick. It's extraordinary. It's nearly all there. You even get the new Europa Wavetable synth. You don't get some of the other synths, so, you know, less synths, uh, less effects, but the key thing is that you have the, the mixer with all of that going on, you have the arranger with all that going on, you have the whole rack of synth workstation stuff, all the things that you would probably use the most, like the drum machines and the samplers and the sequencing, that's all in there, all the combinators, all the different synths, and more importantly, it has the VST support, so you can add whatever plugins you like. It has those new MIDI player devices that they introduced. So you've got a pretty comprehensive synth workstation door audio arranging VST supporting piece of music making software for 69 quid. I mean, the one I suppose limitation is that it is restricted to 16 tracks of audio and 16 instrument tracks. But to be fair, that's plenty. Really, that's what most of us would use, I imagine. So if you've never tried out Reason or you always fancy giving it a bit of a go, then this is definitely an opportunity to do so for not too much of an investment. And if you really, really like it and find yourself pushing away at the boundaries, then upgrade to the full thing. 
There was one synthesizer at Music Mesa, probably because they didn't really seem cool enough to have heard about Superbooth, and that was the Exodus Digital Valkyrie. Now, it sounds like a really impressive name, and we saw images of this a year or so ago, and it looked like an access virus, a desktop version of one of those, sort of kind of sleek and nice and interesting. And the reality of it now that it's available, almost kind of prototype level, is that it's ended up in this really kind of strange and horrible looking box. It's like they've taken the sleek, cool synth thing and dropped it into something really nasty looking. I don't get it. What was that about? I mean, presumably the reality of making the synthesizer was more difficult than they thought and perhaps requires more cooling or a larger power supply or just more technology within the box. But it seems as if they didn't really get around to redesigning it into a coherent piece of gear. And is this important? Well, it is, yeah, because this is hardware and hardware needs to look right as well as sound right. Is that sad but true? No, I think it's just the truth of the matter is that uh, gear, music technology gear, acoustic instruments, whatever, have to have an aesthetic. There has to be a beautifulness about them on their own or something about them that exists in the physical realm. I mean, it even extends down to GUI design in software. I believe that the look of something is as important, perhaps, or getting it to be as important as the sound of it. And certainly that comes down to the user interface and other bits and pieces. It has to be the whole package. And from an initially great start, it seems that the Valkyrie has, I don't know, it's kind of shot itself in the foot rather. However, putting that aside, what it is, is a massively uh, digital fun box of sounds and stuff. It sounds a lot like one of those huge romplers you'd get on your computer. So a whole stack of huge, big, washy digital sounds full of effects. There's like 128 voice polyphony, there's 10 oscillators per voice, there's filters jammed in there, there's nine stackable effects all running at once to make these huge, enormous kind of sounds, like I say, that you get in sort of 99 quid romplers. So I don't really know how to feel about it. I mean, on all the demos, the sounds sounded all right. But again, they didn't sound extraordinary. It didn't sound like anything we hadn't heard before. In fact, it sounded very, very familiar. I guess it's a big hardware synth that has all this, the sounds that you sort of get from software instruments, but stuck in a hardware, never gonna fall over, never gonna crash, always available, always on kind of format. I suppose that's it. I mean, at about 2000 pounds, it just didn't get me excited. Sort of unlike perhaps the new uh, Wardorf uh, quantum synth, you know, things like that, which are beautiful to look at as well as interesting to play. This didn't really have that vibe. I don't know how you get that vibe, but whatever it is, uh, the Valkyrie doesn't seem to have it at the moment. However, if you bypass all the demo videos of it at the show, which were kind of not great, and check out some of the examples on SoundCloud, then you'll find that the sounds themselves can be used to very dramatic effect and there's some definitely some good stuff in there it's just a matter of teasing that out so it could be awesome i'm i'm just not sure yet this popped up in my feed and i was immediately attracted to the idea of putting some strings into my euro rack i mean they have no business being there euro rack tends to be all about monophonic sound sources it doesn't tend to be about polyphony it can be i'm just saying as a general rule it's more of a monophonic kind of thing. So what am I talking about? So anyway, this module popped up called String Theory and inside it was a, a model, a approximation of a Selena strings keyboard, you know, old fashioned keyboard stringy thing. <laughs> I'm not explaining this very well. But anyway, it gives you four notes of polyphony and you can play some strings and stick it as a little Eurorack module, stick it in the Eurorack and have this wonderful paddy stringy sound knocking around. I thought that was a fabulous idea. So I immediately bought one. I mean, it's 45 quid for the kit, which is, which is nothing. I mean, that's the price of an Xbox game. And for that, you can solder together your own string sync for inside your Euro. I think that's flipping awesome. I didn't have any time for that, so I bought the 60 quid one that was made up. And I'm finding it really rather cool. Now it does have one you know, particular controversial point, which is that it doesn't have any CV inputs. There's no CV control over any of the parameters and you can't play it 
from CV because it's polyphonic. If you were trying to use polyphonic CV into it, that would require a much more complicated and difficult module with lots of stuff going on, lots of internal technology, and it would make it hugely expensive and not what this is about. So instead it has just a MIDI input. You have to route MIDI to it and then you can play it from a regular keyboard. Now that had the interesting effect of bringing a MIDI controller keyboard back into my Euro rack. And I hadn't done that up to that point. And it also pushed me into using the Hermod uh, sequencer module thing that I've got, the modular brain. And those two things combined sort of generated this very different sort of music for my rack. It suddenly became very kind of musical, very traditionally musical, like what I would create on a computer. Because up until now, all of my music in my rack has been very sort of generative, very accidental, very random, and just sort of massaging sounds out of these machines. Whereas this was like, oh, I've got to play something, and play something on purpose, and then put something alongside that that goes along with it, sort of on purpose. But it came out with a very sort of pleasing result. So I don't know, it was a bit of a punt really on this, uh, on this module, but go and check it out. If you fancy just some four voices of polyphonic strings, messing about in your Eurorack and you have some form of MIDI that you can send it, then it's definitely worth checking out. And it's made by a guy who calls himself Make Synths, Not War. Yay, let's go with that. Steinberg have got together with Rupert Neve and come up with some really boring looking audio interfaces in that very annoying 1U sort of format. But never mind because it's got Rupert Neve written on the front. What does that mean? Well, Rupert Neve is this old guy who built mixing desks that have a certain legendary sound to them. And so what Steinberg have done is got together with Neve and stolen a couple of transformers and stuck them inside these little audio interfaces. And that allows you to add that legendary sort of saturation and enhanced harmonic sound to any inputs that you plug in. I mean, I find when I'm listening to the radio that I can go, oh yeah, listen to that. You can hear those Neve transformers in the background just enhancing the harmonics of that track. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's good stuff. Ultimately, what Steinberg are doing is getting some, some known awesome technology, sticking it into one of their audio interfaces to give it that fatter, more saturated, more interesting and less digital sound and that's no bad thing like others in the ur range of interfaces they also have some dsp built in to run some yamaha effects so it's a decent little recording solution in either two inputs on the front or four inputs not a great deal but it does have this probably extremely expensive technology inside which will make it sound great which is ultimately what you're after and at 399 euros and 649 euros respectively then i'm afraid it's quality that one has to pay for Here's something a little different that's also appeared at Music Mesa and is going to be appearing at Superbooth along with Yamaha, who I still don't really know why they're, they're there. Well, I guess they're there because of the montage and the big synths that really look out of place at Superbooth. But who knows? Anyway, Camelot. Camelot, strange name. Don't really care. It's something like... <coughs> flip it. It's something like Main Stage on the Apple Mac. Uh, what that is, is kind of a instrument hosting and management piece of software. So you get all your VST plugins, you stack them up, layer them up, and can switch between them like you would in a gig list because it's designed for live performance. So you're at a gig, you've got your keyboard, you load up different instruments, it selects all the right presets, loads it up for you, layers it across your MIDI keyboard, and off you go. Play your song and then just tap for the next song, loads everything up maps it all across your keyboard and off you go. It's an extremely useful piece of software to people who are playing live and using software instruments. But the key thing with Camelot is that it also supports hardware instruments. So it will suck the preset list out of your workstation keyboard or your external synth and allow you to save those and manage those within the same project. So it's not just dealing with software instruments like Mainstage does, it deals with external ones as well. 
They've also added in the ability to show chord sheets and music and attach things and different bits and pieces all in there as well. It's still being developed, but it looked pretty interesting. And for people who are in that situation, I think this could be a really good thing, particularly because it runs on everything, not just on the Apple Mac. It also runs on Windows and iOS and probably Android and your phone and stuff like that as well. One of our most successful articles ever on gearnews.com was the one about those Adidas Roland 808 trainers. It was someone had designed a pair of trainers that you stuck a drum machine in and that had all the coloring from the TR-808 and everyone just went ballistic for them and they never materialized. However, Puma have got in on the action and they launched a set of TR-808 trainers as well, but these ones might actually exist. They don't have a drum machine built in or anything of that nature. You're not going to walk along going dum -ch, dum -ch, dum. no, they've just got the just got the colors of the TR-808 and sort of, you know, rhythm composer written across it, that kind of thing. Apparently it's a genuine collaboration with Roland. So that's exciting. Why am I talking about this? Well, because at the Puma launch party for these very shoes, they also had some guy doing some music on Roland Ira gear. And included in that gear was a little modular rack, which was full of System 500 modules that we'd never seen before. And sadly, I forgot to write them down. Right, they are, in fact, uh, the 510 synth voice. It's kind of a little uh, synthesizer voice in its own right. There's the 505 multi-mode filter. Now, I've not done a multi-mode filter before, so that's quite interesting. The 5316 channel mixer, which looks to be a very useful little module and then the 555 utility which includes things like portamento and sample and hold and other bits and pieces these are all the quite chunky system 500 eurac modules which kind of follows on the style of the system 100 from from way back but what's kind of really great is the idea that roland is still working on eurac stuff because that tended to go a little bit quiet with all the the green ira stuff and the the synthesizers and also the acb virtual modeling of bits and pieces you're kind of wondering whether they have any heart left for real analog or for Eurorack at all. And it's really great to see that there is something coming and that it might actually be really cool. Pittsburgh Modular had one of the coolest new products at NAM. They had this Microvolt 3 something or other, Microvolt thing, which was lovely and sort of thin and nice and sleek and dark with these blue LEDs and sliders and bits and pieces on it. Surprisingly small, but just really lovely because Pittsburgh Modular don't really do really lovely. They do very kind of utility looking stuff with this strangely cream and gray look of all their life form stuff. I mean, brilliant sounding modules, very, very useful. They just look somehow dated and not in a good way. But the Microvolt, very, very cool. And I really love this sort of new direction that they seem to be heading in. And they have now since revealed a fabulous looking sequencer called the Electronic Sequence Designer. Hmm. It has a whole bunch of sliders at the top, a whole bunch of sliders at the bottom, a whole bunch of buttons along the top. Apparently you can run four channels, 32 steps, slide your sliders about, sequence goes through, forwards, backwards, randomly about. Fantastic. Looks amazing. Looks just like the Microvolt. What a great piece of, of gear. I'm really looking forward to finding out more about that fella. I love the sliders that they easy and I just can't get enough of those things. And it also does MIDI, which is could be great also. I mean, I guess the one reservation I have, similarly as I have with the Variegate, as I've said a few times before, is that if you're using the same row of sliders to run four different channels, then it's never really going to represent what you thought it was representing because you're having to change it the next time you do something. Does that make any sense? I know what I mean by that. And it's something that I think in Eurac world, I'm just going to have to get over. Because if you want something that uses sliders for more than one function, then you are always going to be losing the look of where things are. Because, you know, in my mind, I'd like to see a sequence of where the lights are actually representing the notes, like on a piano roll. I guess that's what I'm after. I don't know. I'm just going to have to get over it, as I say, because that just doesn't seem to be a thing that happens. You always got multiple functions on these sliders or multiple channels. And so you should. And that should be fine. Looking forward to seeing more about this at Superbooth. They also have a new oscillator called the Primary Oscillator, which has got lots of sort of interesting cascading wave folding and sculpting 
features in it. Sadly, it's in the old life forms style of kind of strange gray and cream, but hey, we can't have everything. Native Instruments have released version two of their NKS format and correspondingly complete control to the software as well that runs all of that. What does this mean? Complete Control is a piece of software that allows you to run BSG instruments which are mapped automatically to the Complete Control keyboards and controllers and machine, things like that. Plugins have to be compatible with it, but once they are, then it's all mapped and fabulously achievable and findable from directly within the keyboard hardware knobs and controls rather than having to delve into the software GUI. It's great, but it was missing effects. So you can have a lovely piano sorted out, but you'd really like to add a delay and you couldn't really do that. Now, you can. It now supports effects, hooray. So I did a video all about this, uh, which is on the channel where I used the Eventide Black Hole Reverb, which has become NKS compatible. And that is a fabulous thing. I mean, you need to add that to everything, everywhere. Create any instrument you like, some strings, a piano, some synthy sound and just drop the black hole on it. Cool, that's a fantastic time, that is. So go and check that video out if you're interested in NKS stuff and how well that sort of is starting to really gel and work together, I think. Good job. Uh, last month I spoke about the Wave controller from Genki Instruments and how I was quite taken with its ability to control things with a, you know, you've got a ring on your finger and you're moving things about, wow, you're moving filters and modulation and that kind of, that kind of thing. And you're ending up going, oh yeah, 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 we're waving at our synths now. Yes, yes we are. <laughs> but somehow, somehow in there, it seemed that there was enough small movements to make it quite interesting. Plus, they had this CV module, which of course, you know, I'm a sucker for CV stuff. And I thought that might be an interesting thing that I could start waving at my Euro rack and not feel like a complete idiot. Anyway, there's a new kid on the block called Neova. It used to be called the Aurea ring, but they've changed the name for reasons that are unlikely to become clear. And actually they had it out and about far earlier than the Wave one. They just didn't get it to Kickstarter as quickly. So it feels like they're, they're kind of running a little bit behind. However, what they have done seems to be very, very good. First of all, they were at NAMM, and what they did, they set a camera in front of a keyboard, and they got as many famous keyboard players as they could possibly find. <laughs> they dragged them in. I don't know, maybe they tempted them in with beer or sex or something. They dragged them in, sat them down, and got them to play, and all of them seemed really happy. Well, at least, obviously, they're only showing us the videos of the people who are really happy. They don't show us a video of the keyboard player when they say rubbish and throw it all up in the air. No, no, they've kept it to the ones who smile and go, oh, wow, that's awesome, man, wow. Wow, 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 wow. You're not seeing my hand? Wow, 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 that's awesome. So I thought that was an absolute work of genius. You've got all these famous faces really smiling and having a nice time with this controller, regardless, because we can't really hear what they're doing or see what they're doing, but they seem to be very, very pleased by it. So a little bit of genius marketing there. Now, how does it differ from the Wave one? Well, this one uses its own wireless protocol. Rather than relying on Bluetooth MIDI, they have their own wireless thing going with this, this kind of, this sort of disappointingly plastic hub thing. I mean, <laughs> the hub looks like some kind of 1990s peripheral for some kind of gaming controller. I don't know, I'm sure it's fabulous. It just has a far more plasticky look, as does the ring generally, than the Wave one does. But the advantage of using this hub is that it acts as a charger, first of all, and secondly, it will always work because that plugs in via USB to your computer rather than via Bluetooth MIDI trying to work that out. So the connection to the hub is always there. That's always going to function because it's proprietary. And then you plug in via USB or directly via MIDI. So that's an interesting take on it. It also allows them to use a high resolution potentially, so that could be interesting. And it has some preset buttons on it. So yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, the Genki one, the, the Wave has these buttons on it itself that add extra functionality. The uh, Nuova, ne Neova one doesn't really have that. So these are these two things are both gonna be coming out at about the end of the year or early next year. So it's gonna be quite fascinating to see which way it goes, but it seems to be the year 
of the wearable ring controller. How interesting. Meanwhile, back in Beringer land, Yuli has been asking Eurorack users what they would like to see if perhaps Behringer might think about cloning some Eurorack modules. Well, he then ignored everyone's suggestions and put forward a whole bunch of renders, which were a clone of the Roland System 100M. Now, the System 100M is an old sort of modular system that Roland did kind of as an extension to their System 100 keyboard. And essentially what Behringer are saying is that we're going to clone this thing because it's a complete sort of coherent modular system. And they're going to pop them out for about 89 quid. 89 quid per module. I mean, that's kind of stunning, really. Or is it? Is it stunning? I don't know. See, the thing from these renders is that is that they really look completely dull and uninspired. I mean, you know, the System 100, the old stuff, they didn't have much of an aesthetic. They didn't have a great layout or anything like that. They were excited because they were they're new and interesting back then. These days, I think we demand a bit more from our modules and our modular makers. We want something interesting, something different. And personally, cloning an old established modular system is a bit of a cop out. It lacks originality, it lacks imagination, you know? It might be great, but it's not like resurrecting an old synth that everybody wants. This is resurrecting some old modules that have already been redone and reworked and made into something more interesting down the line. So this one sort of, to me, makes less sense than anything else. I mean, what they should do is flip in innovate. I mean, Behringer are at their best when they take risks and they they push into different things, like with the DeepMind 12. It wasn't just a Juno ripoff. They put extra stuff in there with uh, effect sections and strange virtual reality bits and pieces. And they really sort of pushed the envelope starting from a known space into something more interesting. Same with the Neutron or something slightly different, slightly interesting. Give us that, Behringer, not this sort of bland looking case of old modules. But on the other hand, what it means is that you could get yourself a kick-ass modular system, all of those modules together for about a grand. I mean, that's extraordinary. I mean, obviously you still have to buy a case and it makes complete sense to me for Behringer to start making their own case or to sell it as a complete cased unit. And cases is certainly one place or one area that would benefit greatly from some competition and some cheapening because it's expensive out there. The power supply and case situation for Eurac, it's, it's really very expensive. And I, for one, would applaud anyone who's able to come up with you know, a half decent uh, and cheap Eurac case solution. I think that would be a good thing. So yeah, kind of great, kind of drab, kind of disappointing. And uh, now last month I unintentionally missed out IK Multimedia, who had just released this enormous bundle of everything. You get everything in the one bundle for a stupidly, ridiculously low bundle price. Everything is stuffed in there. Just gigs and gigs and gigs of uh, Marislav string library and synthesizers and amplifiers and all this stuff. All the stuff bundled up into one thing that I meant to mention. But anyway, since then, they've also released five new classic, I suppose, synthesizers into their Syntronic collection, uh, making it into the Syntronic Deluxe collection. They now have the Memory Moog Polysynth. See, I can't say that. It just has to be Memory Moog. I don't know. The Memory Moog Polysynth, that sounds so much better. You know, sod how they say their own name. What do they know? We know it better than anyone. Then there's a combined Roland SH2 and SH5, and also a hybrid sort of Korg Monopoly slash Poly 6. The old favorite, the Putney EMS VCS3, that gets a bit of a treatment. And rounding it off is the Modulum, Modulum, the Modulum, which pulls percussive sounds out of a collection of different synthesizers that have been squashed and bashed together. It continues to be a great collection of sample-based synthesizers that have got a lot of virtual analog wizardry built into them to make them sound more authentic. They're great synths and I'm going to give them a really good working out on the surface, I think, as soon as I can get around to it. Also, IK Multimedia are going along to Superbooth. The rumour has it 
that they have a couple of bits of hardware to announce and reveal. I mean, dare I say it, most of IK Multimedia's hardware is kind of a bit on the low end plastic side. They like all their iRigs and iBits and pieces which plug into iPhones and iPads. And they tend to be, you know, cheap and cheerful plastic things. So when I hear they're going to do some hardware and they're going to release it at Superbooth, which is the kind of the super nerdy synthesizer show, they've really got to be fairly confident that they're going to do something decent. Something half decent, something interesting, something that's not going to fall apart when you just sort of poke your finger at it. So what have they got? I don't know, we should find out sort of next week, I suppose. It's kind of interesting. Out of nowhere, Dreadbox have resurrected the Erebus. Hooray! They've simplified it a bit, streamlined it, stuck it into a, a little cardboard box, called it a kit, made it fit into Eurorack, and have released it for about 150 quid. That's just flipping awesome. I mean, the Erebus was one of the, the first synthesizers that I considered when I started my little hardware synthesis journey. I mean, I was looking at the Mother 32, at the No Coast, and the Erebus. And I thought at one point that just having those three synthesizers would be plenty. I could get stuck into that, you could patch them together, and I'll be as happy as Larry. Sadly, I went the Eurorack route. <laughs> I got pulled down the Eurorack rabbit hole, and so I kind of had to leave the Erebus behind because it wasn't really going to fit in with what I was trying to do. But I was just, it was a lot of fun to play with, I found, at synth shows. But a couple of months ago, uh, Dreadbox discontinued it, quite sadly, I thought, but now they've brought it back as this DIY kit. They did the same thing with the Hades, and I think they kind of sold like synthesizer hotcakes, and I think the same thing's gonna happen with this. They're calling it the Little Erebus. They've taken off some of the controls. You haven't got individual tuning over the oscillators anymore. They've simplified the envelope, but you've still got, it's still a paraphonic synthesizer and it's still got the echo, which is very, very important, I think, to the character of that whole synth. The fact that you can now stick it in the Eurorack is awesome, or you can just use the cardboard box it came in to use it as a desktop synth. And inside there, if you buy the desktop version, you get a little Eurorack power supply that can power three modules. So you could, you know, stretch out your cardboard box a little bit and add a couple of extra modules, which is a great idea. So if you are looking to start in Eurorack, then I would get over to the Dreadbox website and pick up one of these like straight away because they're going to sell out really quick. I think the desktop version is like 200 quid or 200 euros and the the one that comes without the extra desktop bits and so just for Eurorack is about 150, which is a great price for a great little synth. Get a little lunchbox case. Fantastic, what a great idea. Oh, I wish I could start this journey all over again. <laughs> <laughs> now, Sound Machines have been kicking around this idea for a couple of years now. It keeps cropping up at shows. They're sort of fascinating arches idea. Now it uses this inspiration from the Buchler easel control touch plate thingies, touch plate controllers. So these aren't keys that you press down. These are capacitive touch controller strips, which are very common in Buchler modular and creep up in modular synths all over the place. The Arches is a great looking controller with all the way that it, it curves in so that you know that it's about arches. I mean, they've even put brackets either side of the name arches just in case you needed sort of further hints that it's about sort of curvature and stuff or really i think they put those things in just to annoy people like me who get annoyed by things like that but anyway arches is full of these light strips that they've done for quite some time in fact I, funnily enough i just got had one arrived today a little light strip i'll show you it looks a bit like this see that Zoom. Yeah, so this material here is a capacitive touch strip so that you can generate control voltage and stuff by moving your fingers up and down. It's got these LEDs around it where you are and it will actually record the CD inside itself. So this kind of technology is then being transplanted into arches where you have a whole load of controls that you can use on multiple fingers all at once. It can be sort of buttonized into a keyboard. It could be slid around. You've got X, Y pads to control other parameters. You've got 32 patch points spewing control voltage over your whole rack without any problem. And a little bit of genius is that they've also worked in a sequencer using the little lights 
on the strips to denote where your notes are. So you've got an eight step sequencer and also a five track, eight step drum machine. Brilliant. What a brilliant thing. They've just launched it on Kickstarter, so they're looking for pre-orders in order to, uh, to gauge interest and see whether they can actually build the thing. It does also support MIDI output as well, which makes it very interesting, but you could easily run your entire rack from it. What's slightly confusing me at the moment is that there aren't really any good demo videos of showing how all these things come together. I mean, there's plenty of people moving their fingers up and down and you hearing modulation happening, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. And we're not really seeing that yet. So I'm not fully understanding its capabilities. And a lot of the capabilities are kind of assumed. I'm assuming it will do this. I'm assuming it can do that. I'm assuming it's gonna be fabulous. We really need to see more of it to fully appreciate what's going on. It's also rather expensive, but it's gonna be a high quality piece of gear, assuming it does everything as well as it appears to do. And finally, there's a lot of stuff leaking and emerging in our run-up to what is undoubtedly going to be the most classic super booth ever that I won't be attending. Everyone seems to have something to reveal or a prototype to poke about at, or some kind of fake sort of faceplate that they can put somewhere that does extraordinary things that no one has ever heard of that they don't ever actually have to produce. Endorphin has something extremely black and dark to show. Bacusa are going to be there with their super, super wavetable thing actually working. There's cool modules from Audiophile Circuit League, from the League of Audiophile Circuits. There's some strange, there's some cool new modules from the Audio Circuits. No, the Audiophile, no, the League of Audiophile Circuits or something. Expert Sleepers have something new. Bitwig, in fact, have branded an Expert Sleepers ES8 which is very interesting. And I think that's an, an awesome sort of combination of things to do because Bitwig has these fantastic um, hardware and CV generating devices within it that need an easy way of getting into Eurorack. And it's a pain if you don't have the right audio interface or trying to find the right audio interface with DC coupled inputs and outputs, it makes it quite hard work. Whereas the Expert Sleepers ES8 is perfectly designed to do exactly that, to root CV to and from your computer and your Eurorack. Brilliant. It's just flipping pricey. And that's always annoyed me. It's like 450 quid. It's a lot just to do that, that one seemingly simple task. What I would really like to see would be to Bitwig to get together with Expert Sleepers and produce a simpler one, maybe a four in, four out, thin module that would sit in your Eurorack, you know, for a hundred quid maybe, just to give you that potential of control to and from Bitwig. I think that would be an extraordinary thing. Or for Behringer to clone something like the ES8, to do that, to provide uh, an ADA and audio ASIO controlled DC coupled audio interface for Eurorack. That would be interesting because expert sleepers, God love them, they sort of don't have any competition in this area. And so they can kind of charge what they like. And I'm not saying that they do charge what they like. I'm just saying it's expensive, man. And I wish, I wish there was a cheaper solution to it. Anyway, so at Superbooth, there's gonna be a whole stack of stuff, loads and loads and loads of it. And I will get on top of it and get going with it as soon as I possibly can. And all of my coverage would of course be on gearnews.com as it happens until the moment that I go away camping. And then I'm gonna to have to find an internet cafe or something to do a little bit of reporting on it. Who knows? Hopefully you saw my review on the Vermona Random Rhythm, which is an excellent little randomization gating trigger box for Eurorack. What a fantastic thing. So go and check that out. But coming up on my schedule of reviews, I have the Erica Synths graphic VCO that I've had for far too long now. I really should understand something about it. I don't know that I do yet, but I'm working on it. Also reviews of the Hermod brain sequencer thingy that I'm just starting to have a poke at. Eventide are gonna send me their Euro delay DDL thing, which is interesting. I should have that in a week or two. So I'm gonna give that a good going over. And I am still planning to do a roundup of all the latest doors on 
the Surface Pro. I still do Surface stuff. Oh yes, I do. So I want to do Pro Tools 2018. I want to do Reason 10, Ableton Live 10, Stage Light 3.5, Waveform 9, all of those guys running on the Surface Pro just so you can see how well they work. Do a bit of a demo, show you what's good, what's bad, how the touch works, how well that integrates, that kind of thing. It all just takes a bit of time. Time, phew, it just goes, phew, just like that. I mean, it's nearly May already, although you wouldn't know it with the sort of changeable weather we're having just at the moment. People have also started asking me to do sort of patch videos, unpacking patches that I did, because I did one all about making an ambient patch and that's been extremely well received, which is cool. And now I'm getting asked to sort of unpack more of my noodles and I've been, I've been thinking about that. In some ways it's interesting, but it's also time consuming and it in some ways prevents me from moving on if you know what I mean, I have to leave something rigged up until I can sit down and then work it all out and then undo it and then do it again on camera. So I will try to do that once I come up with something which I think is fascinating enough to stick on video. But I thought of maybe taking another tact. I mean, I've talked about doing live streaming before. Maybe this is a situation where live streaming could become useful. I mean, it's not usually how I like to work because I like to practice and I like to prepare and I like to edit the heck out of, out of the finished results. So I take out all the ums, all the errs, all the sniffs, all the snorts, all the 10 minutes me sitting there going, I have no idea what I'm doing and trying, oh no, and then research something and coming back and then filming that bit. So on a live stream, I'm kind of naked to the reality of who I am and what I am and how I'm able to engage in this medium. But the advantages would be that I could just sit a camera down, I could turn it on, start live streaming, and I could talk about the rack as it is. I could move things around and explain what I've done. And people could at the same time ask me to, to do different things or to mess it about or to explain certain things that they don't understand. And that could be a potentially interesting and interactive time. And sort of failing all that, I could just like start patching some stuff together and make some music. I mean, that on its own might be worthwhile and interesting. I don't know, I'm just trying to come up with, with more ways to engage with the audience and to attract more viewers because I'm still trying to navigate my way through this so that I can make this what I do for a living, if you see what I mean. But it wouldn't have to be just modular, we could talk about any sort of music technology. I can get other things out and show those and muck those about. I don't know. But all I can say is let's give it a go. Let's see what happens. I mean, there'll probably be no sound. The video will probably be poorly lit or it'll all crap out or something. Who knows? But we're just gonna give it a go and see what happens. So come and join me. Let's say Sunday night, this Sunday, 8 p.m. British summer time, whatever that is, wherever you are, hopefully you're not clashing with anyone important. We're just gonna turn it on and give it a go. And that's this Sunday. So that's Sunday the 29th of April. So if you're watching this a little bit too late, then you might have missed it. But then look out for the next one, because if it works, if it's interesting, if people enjoy it, if I enjoy it, then we'll do it again. And if it's rubbish, then we probably won't. Similarly with the podcast, it was someone's idea and it's a good one that you just take the audio track and stick it up as a podcast so people can listen to it on their way to work. That seems like a really simple thing to do. So I'm going to give that a go with this episode. So go on to iTunes, I guess, and search for it. Search for Multi Music Monthly. And if you can't find it, it probably means that I haven't managed to achieve <laughs> putting that onto iTunes. Who knows? We shall see. And if you feel so inspired, then do please check out my Patreon page and consider supporting me, becoming a patron, and help me fund these videos going into the future. There's a fabulous bunch of people on there who are doing it already, and they're just simply amazing. But in the meantime, go and make some tunes. <laughs>